Take your Bibles this morning and open them to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, find verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. If you don't have a Bible with you today, there's one in the pew rack there in front of you or down to your left or your right, and I would encourage you to, to reach out and get that Bible and find page 952. 952, you'll find 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. We're going to look at the first five verses of this second chapter, and then we'll skip down in just uh, in the latter part of the message and look at verses 10 through 16. It's going to take me about half of the message. I'll just go ahead and warn you. It's going to take me about half the message to get to the text. So just wait. I'm going to get there, okay? I'm, I'm going to get there. But, but we're in this series of messages that I'm calling, Can You Hear Me Now? It's a series of messages designed to teach us how to hear the voice of God in our lives. And so second. Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. If you found it, would you pray with me? And, and we're going to talk about this very thing this morning, but would you pray that the Lord would speak to your heart through His Word and through His messenger this morning? That's, pray for yourself and then pray for me that I can be His messenger today to deliver His Word. Heavenly Father, thank You for the opportunity to come and share Your Word today. I pray that You would tune out any distraction that might creep into our hearts and minds today. Allow us, Father, not to be distracted by it and give us listening ears to hear your voice. Some of the things, Father, that we hear today will be brand new to many of us. Others, Father, will hear things they've heard before and just need to be reinforced in their life, need to be reminded of it, and, and so that, Father, our faith can be strengthened and our walk can be deepened with you. Father, there's so many competing voices in the culture today, and, and we need to know how to hear you. And so, Father, I pray that you would uh, accomplish your purpose and your will in everybody's life this morning as we seek to hear your voice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. It should be the norm for you to regularly hear from the Lord. It should be the norm for you as a believer to regularly hear from the Lord. You were made for it. And I, I've repeated that three weeks in a row now because I want you to understand that. You were made for it. You were created to live in an ongoing relationship and an ongoing conversation with your Heavenly Father. It's the way He designed you. He wants to communicate with you. But how? How does he do it? Well, I want you to watch a video clip. It's two minutes long. And I want you to feel free to sing along and even clap if you like. All right? Trey, show the clip. Here's how God communicates with us. Get in touch with God. Turn your radio on. Did you hear that line in the song? Everybody is a radio receiver. Get in touch with God. Turn your radio on. You see, we are like this radio. We need, we need to turn our radio on. But when we do, listen. You get static, don't you? You get static. You got to find the right station. Boy, there's, Lord, don't let somebody be something be playing that's not a problem. I don't know what that is. But the point is, is when you turn radio on, 
Actually, I tried to find the station in Winsboro that plays Southern Gospel so I would not have, like, you know, Bruno Mars come over the loudspeaker. Be enough of him this afternoon. But when you're, when you're listening to the radio, you got static. And when you get static on your radio, that means you're not tuned in to the, to the right station. You have, to, you have to find the right spot. Now, with digital radio today, you just turn to it. But you remember how it was, you know, and how it is with that radio that I got in 1917. Uh, <laughs> you have to tune it finely until you get right on the spot. So the message comes through. Everybody is a radio receiver. Now, we learned last week that we do need to clear the clutter, and I called it clutter last week, but this week I want to call it static. We, we, we need to clear the clutter or the static from our lives in order to place ourselves in a position to hear from the Lord. Let me remind you what that clutter is. Let me remind you what that static is. There is the static of hurry, because we are a busy people. We are a busy people doing good things. Our days are filled with good activities, but we're trapped by our schedules. Remember Richard Foster's words, hurry is not of the devil, it is the devil. There's the static of hurry that we need to clear from our life. The second static is presumption. We presume God is going to answer in a certain way. He's blessed this way before, and we go do it that same way again, and that may not be what He wants to do. Or we presume we can handle it. This is just a little thing, God. I got this. The static of presumption. And then there's the static of rebellion. We just refuse to do what we know God is wanting us to do. We're going to do what we want to do regardless of what God says. That is the clutter and static of rebellion. And then finally there's the static of tradition. We have always done it this way before. And God may want to do something fresh and new in your life. He may not want to do it like he's always done it. So you get in touch with God. So you turn your radio on. You begin by clearing away the static. So let's begin this morning with our life point. Here is your prayer. Here is what I want your prayer to be in response to this message. Lord, eliminate the static of this world and strengthen my spiritual senses. Now learn this, God does business with those who mean business. You see that phrase, strengthen my spiritual senses. God does business with those who mean business. So we live our lives, carry out our day, expecting God to guide us. We go through our day, we live our lives expecting God to speak to us. That's what I mean when I say strengthen my spiritual senses, Lord. I'm expecting to hear from you. Strengthen my expectancy, Lord. Also strengthen my desire to do your will. Listen, God's direction, God's voice is only for those who are already committed to doing as He leads. The Lord is not going to show you His way. The Lord is not going to speak to you about His will. The Lord is not going to guide you in the path that He wants you to go. If you haven't made up your mind that whatever He shows you to do, that's what you're going to do. The Lord is not going to show you His way until you have already committed in your heart, Lord, I'm going to do it. Until you have already committed to do it His way. Christian author Philip Yancey writes, I cannot control the voice of God or how it comes. I can only control my ears, my readiness to listen, and my quickness to respond. Let me say that again. I cannot control the voice of God or how it comes. I can only control my ears, 
spiritual ears. My readiness to listen and my quickness to respond. The writer of Proverbs puts it this way. Look at Proverbs chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and 5. I've got it on the screen for you. If you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. I'm talking about strengthening our spiritual senses. Lord, eliminate the static of this world and strengthen my spiritual senses. Get yourself ready to be in business with God. Hearing God as the norm, hearing God as a day-to-day -day reality is only for those people who are devoted to doing the will of God, who are devoted to the glory of God and the advancement of His kingdom where they live and where they work. It is to say, I am living for one thing and one thing only, and that is to do God's will. I want to serve Him and I want to bless others where He has placed me in my day. Strengthen your spiritual senses. Now listen, God's not going to compete for your attention. God will not compete for your attention. Oh, occasionally a bush will burn or a pole will get knocked down to the ground by a blinding light, but, but we should expect in most cases that God is not going to run us down or shout over the static in our lives to get our attention. It's not going to compete for it. So Lord, eliminate the static of this world and strengthen my spiritual senses. Okay, here we go. You've eliminated the static as best you can. You've eliminated the static from your world and your ears are perked. Your spiritual senses are up. You are ready to do His will, whatever it is. Your devotion is, is up. You are ready to hear Him and respond. So, what are you listening for? Well, generally speaking, there are six ways in the Bible that God addressed people. There are six ways in which God, excuse me, in which people are addressed by God in the biblical record. I want to mention four and deal with two. I want to deal with the two most common today. Now, please understand, I, I leave room for God to speak to you in any way He wants to speak to you. God is God and He can choose to communicate with you in any way that He wants to communicate with you. He alone chooses how He speaks to us. He can communicate with you in any way He chooses. But it's been my experience that there are two primary ways that He speaks to us. So, let me mention the first four ways that are found in Scripture and then the final two, and we'll deal with those extensively. Now again, the Lord may choose to use one of any of these first four ways to speak to you, but it will be the exception, not the norm. The four of them are on the screen for you. God can speak, and it's clear in the biblical record, that He speaks through a phenomenon plus a voice. Now, in Genesis 15, there is fire from God passing through the sacrifice that Abraham had prepared. The most obvious and, and the first one that you probably would think is the burning bush that Moses heard in Exodus chapter 3, a phenomenon plus a voice. But you also, if you'll remember the baptism of Jesus, there was a dove and a voice of God at Jesus' baptism. And then Saul's conversion experience on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, there was a blinding light and a voice. God does speak. It's clear in the biblical record through a phenomenon plus a voice. He also speaks through a supernatural messenger or an angel. 
Let me just mention a few out of Scripture. The men at the door of Abraham's tent in Genesis chapter 18. The man standing, with jo- standing before Joshua with his sword drawn in Joshua chapter 5. There's Gideon's encounter in Judges chapter 6. And then when you come to the New Testament, there is Zechariah, there is Joseph, there is Mary, there is Peter, there is Paul in the New Testament. All that were sent angelic or heavenly messengers with a word from God. Tiger Kaufman, even two weeks ago, said, sat here and told us about the nurse at the foot of his bed who he believed was an angel from God. The third way is dreams and visions. And I don't have to tell you that. That's nothing new. If you read your Bible, you know that God spoke to Jacob in a dream. He spoke to Joseph in a dream. He spoke to Peter in Acts chapter 10 in a dream. He speaks to people in the biblical record through dreams. And then the fourth one is an audible voice. Abraham on top of Mount Moriah about to sacrifice his son Isaac. Halt! Stop! The voice, an audible voice. And young Samuel, as he lay on his pallet in 1 Samuel chapter 3, he heard the voice of God, didn't know who it was. Eli had to tell him the third time when he came into Eli and said, Eli, what do you want? Eli said, I haven't said anything. But I keep hearing this voice that says, come here. And Eli finally had to tell him, Samuel, that's the voice of God. So, we must remain open to the possibility of God addressing us in whatever way He chooses. He can use any of those four ways. They are biblical ways that God addresses His people. We must remain open to the possibility of God addressing us in whatever way He chooses or else we may walk right past our burning bush. But let's concentrate this morning on the two primary ways. And these are the two primary ways the Lord spoke to men and women in Scripture. And these are the two primary ways that He still speaks to us today. So, let's complete our life point this morning with with this phrase. Lord, eliminate the static of this world and strengthen my spiritual senses so that I may discern your powerful voice. I want that to become your prayer today. Lord, eliminate the static of this world and strengthen my spiritual senses so that I may discern your powerful voice. So how do we discern his powerful voice today? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me read verses 1 through 5. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you... Excuse me. When I came to you, brothers... When... And I can't even read it. Let me read. Start all over. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. No means of communication between God and us is more commonly used in the Bible and in the history of the church, I might add, than God giving guidance and direction and wisdom through the voice of another human being. Now, that's one of the things I pray happens in your life every Sunday. As you sit in a Bible fellowship group, as you listen to my voice each Sunday, I pray for you to hear the voice of God. I pray God speaks through me to you. It's exactly what Paul prayed as well. Look at these verses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 1. Paul's coming to the Corinthians was not with excellency of words. It was not with lofty speech. Paul did not depend on his overwhelming, overpowering oratory skills. He came proclaiming the testimony of God and he centered his attention on Jesus Christ. Christ. That's verse 2. Paul was not interested in discussing men's ideas. Paul was not interested in discussing men's insights. Paul's only concern was being God's mouthpiece to impart to them the testimony of God. And he did it, he says, in fear 
and trembling. I can relate. I, I, I don't stand here Sunday after Sunday to give you my opinion about the cultural issues. My opinion about the cultural issues. I don't stand here Sunday after Sunday to offer you my political persuasion. I don't stand here Sunday after Sunday to give you my economic strategy. You have come to hear a word from the Lord through your pastor. And every Sunday, I feel a sense of inadequacy apart from the Spirit's empowerment. I don't come to you. I, I, I don't want to be full of persuasive words and clever words. I want to be full of the Holy Spirit of God. Fear and trembling. And the result will be that you hear the voice of God speak truth, speak guidance, speak direction into your life. Look at verse 5. That your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Lord, eliminate the static of this world and strengthen my spiritual senses so that I may discern your powerful voice. You see, I don't want your faith to be anchored in. And this is what verse 4 and, and 5 say. When it, Paul talks about that in demonstration of the Spirit's power and, and wisdom, that your faith will not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. I don't want your faith to be anchored in. Well, Brother Pepper says... I, I don't want your faith to be anchored in, well, Brother Pepper said that. Brother Pepper says this. No, I want your faith to be anchored in, thus saith the Lord. The Lord says this. God says this. Your faith will not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, here's what I'm saying. The primary objective way in which God addresses us is God speaking to us through another human's voice. Look at what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 says this. When you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. You see, Paul's talking about his preaching and his teaching among the Thessalonian believers. And Paul is saying, when I stood before you and preached and when I taught the Word of God to you, you accepted it for what it really is. You didn't accept it as just the words of men, opinions of men. You accepted it for what it really is, the Word of God. And I pray that you will hear the voice of God every Sunday in your life when I stand in this spot. Now, certainly I'm not the only human voice God uses to guide you. I'm, I'm not the only human voice that God is going to use to guide you. There are hundreds of other godly men and women that the Lord will use in your life to guide you. Men that you will listen to, women that you will listen to preach and teach. You will, you will read their books. There will be godly men and women that you go to for personal counsel and, it, and advice. There will be hundreds of other people in your life whom God will use to speak into your life His truth his guidance, His direction. You will find and hear the Word of God through the words of another human being. Let me just tell you something I've noticed. It's been my experience through the years. When God chooses to use a human instrument to speak, when God speaks through human beings, it often seems that He chooses the weaker vessels to do it. It often seems that weaker vessels are purposely chosen. Biblically, there's Moses and there's Paul, two of the people most responsible for the human authorship of the Bible. When you think about it, Moses and Paul wrote more of the Bible than any other human instrument. But both were weak with their words. 
So that there would be no doubt as to the source of their power. No doubt as to the source of their authority. And then think of two Sundays ago. When Tiger Kaufman sat right here in a, in a wheelchair. And delivered a clear, powerful word from God. It's oftentimes that God uses the weaker vessels to communicate His greatest truth. Lord, eliminate the static of this world and strengthen my spiritual senses so that I may discern Your powerful voice. God uses human voices to speak to us. Our co-laborers, our friends, the Holy Spirit seems to mix and mingle His words with, in, and through the voices of others. Now, while the primary objective way in which God addresses us is God speaking to us through another human's voice, the primary subjective way that God addresses us is in our own spirit. It is through what some call the still, small voice. For those who are walking close to God, for those who are living in harmony with God, this is the most common way that God will speak through the still, small voice. Look at verse 10. Move down in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 to verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? For also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The still, small voice. Now, let me just walk you through these words. Hang, hang with me because this is so important. This is so crucial. Let me just walk you through this verse by verse. It's so important that you understand this passage because it is the key to hearing God speak to you through the still, small voice. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, the deep things of God may be known. The deep things of God can be known. And it is the Holy Spirit's job to reveal them to you. It is the Spirit's job to search out the wisdom of God and the truth of God and then speak to you those things, to speak the wisdom and the truth of God to you. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit will teach us all things and guide us into the truth. But Jesus also said that He will not speak His own words, but He will speak only what He hears from the Father, and what He hears from the Father He will declare to you. And so it is the Holy Spirit's job to reveal the deep things of God to you. Now, verse 11 is an illustration. Verse 11 simply says, only a man knows the things that goes on inside his head. I may know you pretty well. We may be great friends. We may spend a lot of our spare time together. But I don't know what goes on inside your head. Only you know what goes on inside your head, your feelings and your thoughts. In the same way, the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit knows what's going on inside the mind of God. And that same, verse 12, that same Holy Spirit lives in you. And it is His job to reveal the mind of God to you. It is His job to reveal so that you may understand and hear the voice of God. Now listen, the Holy Spirit will never lead you to do anything that isn't God's will. He speaks exactly what He hears from the Father. The Holy Spirit influences your mind, your will, your emotions, your body. The Holy Spirit influences your mind, your will, your emotion, your body to desire what to, 
to do what is pleasing to God. It is your responsibility to cooperate by obeying His promptings and bathing yourself in prayer. Now look at the last three verses. Verse 14, 15, and 16. Do you know what verse 14 says? Verse 14 says the natural person, the unsaved person, cannot receive the things of the Spirit. The unsaved person cannot grasp spiritual truth. Why? Well, it makes perfect sense. He doesn't have the capacity to do so. It is the Spirit that makes us understand spiritual truth. And an unsaved, natural man is not indwelt by the Spirit. And so he cannot receive the things of the Spirit. Spiritual truth, spiritual insight to the unsaved person is false. It is foolishness, but not you. You have the capacity to discern the voice of God. You have the capacity because you are indwelt by the Spirit of God. You've got a radio receiver. If you'll just turn it on and get in touch with God. That's why, now hear me and hear me well. That's why when you tell an unbeliever, whether they be your friends or your relatives, when you tell an unbeliever something that God has said to you or God has told you to do, that's why they look at you like you're crazy. Or they pass judgment on you. Or they don't understand why you would want to do that. Why would you want to do that? Because... They don't have the capacity to comprehend spiritual truth. Don't let an unbeliever pass judgment on you, talk you out of something, ridicule you, look down on you. Don't you let an unbeliever pass judgment on you for doing what you believe to be the leading of God. An unbeliever is clueless when it comes to receiving anything from God, they, from hearing God. They don't, they don't have a receiver at all. Now, that's the pepper translation of verse 15. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Don't you let a lost man, don't you let a natural man tell you what is and is not the will of God for your life or look at you and go, why would you want to, why would you want to do that? He has no capacity at all to understand the things of the Spirit. But you do. Now, look at verse 16. And you need to underline verse 16. You need to yell a highlight verse 16. You need to put a star by verse 16. You need to bend your Bible so it flops open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. The last phrase, but we have the mind of Christ. Simply put, it means our thoughts are Christ's thoughts. The Holy Spirit speaks into your head the very thoughts of Christ. And most of the time, I'd kind of like to know what he thinks about things. No, all the time, I'd like to know so I can walk in that path and in that direction. The Holy Spirit is that powerful, still, small voice who speaks to you the mind of Christ so you can incorporate it into your daily living. His thoughts become our thoughts. And as we grow as believers, Christ's thoughts increasingly shape our every move. As we mature as believers, Christ's thoughts increasingly form and shape our daily life. His love becomes your love. His intentions become your intentions. His actions become your actions. And then you reach a place in your walk with Christ where you are living in daily conversation with Him. You are living in an ongoing, continual conversation with Him. You are living in perfect harmony with Him because you have the mind of Christ. Let me ask you a question. What thoughts continually come to your mind? 
What, what thought or thoughts continually are coming to your mind? Do you have a recurring thought or thoughts? You, you might want to follow up on that. Lord, eliminate the static of this world and strengthen my spiritual senses so that I may discern your powerful voice. You may want to follow up on that thought that you just never can seem to get out of the back of your mind. Just might be the Spirit of God speaking the mind of Christ into your head. There are dangers. This is the one, one great thing about being a Baptist. Priesthood of the believer. There are dangers to encouraging people to hear from God on their own. You see, if, if, if I wanted to, I would just get you here every Sunday morning and I would say, okay, I have God's word, I have God's voice, I have God's will for your life, and you don't get it anywhere else but right here on Sunday morning. Uh-uh. 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 You, along with God, hear His voice. And act accordingly. That's dangerous. It is dangerous to encourage people to hear from God on their own. I know that. I know that as a pastor. This could get disastrously out of hand. People could go off the deep end. Doing things. God told me to do this. God told me to do that. Could end up disastrously. People could go off the deep end. But my greater fear is that you stay in the shallow end and you never grow in your faith to where you learn to hear the voice of God yourself. My, de my fear, my greater fear is that we stay in the shallow end. You stay in the shallow end and never grow to your full capacity as a believer. Recognizing God's voice is something you must learn to do yourself. It will come through a little trial and error. It will come through a lot of personal experience. But it will come. And then you will have reached the normal Christian life. Let's pray. Father, all we desire is the normal Christian life. A life that walks in an ongoing conversation with you, our Heavenly Father. Father, I pray this morning that we could eliminate the static. And we could strengthen our spiritual senses in order that we may hear and discern your powerful voice in our lives. So Father, keep us, keep us moving forward in this journey with you and this adventure of learning how to hear your voice. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. In a moment, we'll stand and sing a decision hymn. It's, it's our custom. It's one of those traditions. Can you do a decision hymn and not stand? I don't know.
But here's what I mean. Here's why we do it. The purpose is so biblical. The way we do it is tradition, but the purpose is so biblical. You may want to make a physical response to what you've heard today, and by that I mean you may want to come to this altar and get on your knees and say, Lord, there is so much static and clutter in my life right now, I couldn't hear you if you had a megaphone. And I'm coming today, and I'm here down front because it, I, I can point back and say, you know, I went down on that Sunday, and I committed myself to get the clutter out of my life. And, Lord, that's why I'm here this morning. I'm here on my knees wanting you to get the clutter out of my life so I can hear your voice. Get the static out of my life, Lord, so I can hear your voice. That's why we give an invitation. So you can make a physical response to the message, the voice of God that you hopefully have heard this morning. Then there's another reason. Because from time to time we have people that want to join our church. They feel led of God to be a part of this family and this body. They want to plant their life here and their families here and serve with us. And They're already believers. They already know the Lord Jesus, the same Lord Jesus that we know. And this is just one of the ways... And one of the times that a person can join our church. You come down an aisle, you talk to me or one of our staff, just express to us your desire to be a member of our church. We welcome you today. And then always, always, we will never leave without giving you an opportunity to confess Christ as Lord. That's what Elena did this morning in the baptismal waters. She made a public confession of her faith in Christ. Coming down an aisle is just the first step toward that public confession of your faith in Christ. And so brothers, sir, ma'am, teenager, if you're here this morning and are willing to simply do what Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, which is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. You come this morning with that testimony on your lips, on your heart. You come this morning confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let's stand. Let's stand. We stand to make it easier for people to come. Well, they don't have to stand up and come. All they've got to do is step out and come. And so we're going to sing and... You, you step out and come. Let's sing.